So I read the last half of Psalm 36 a moment ago. We're going to read the first four verses and spend our time uh, mostly there today. Last Sunday, uh, Jimmy Smith began a new series, Blueprints, uh, Building Godly Character. And your character is being formed uh, every day. It doesn't make a difference if that's good character or bad character. You are forming it, investing in it, shaping it every day. And your character isn't like your, your public persona of what you're, you think you are or want people to think you are. It's who you really are. And what are you doing with your character? So that's what we're working on in uh, this series over these few weeks. And we are formed in our character, by the way, by the choices we make the commitments that we embrace, the values we live out on a daily basis. Love church history stories. There's a story from 1805. Uh, A number of uh, Indian chiefs, warriors, gathered together in a council, Buffalo Creek, New York. And they came together to hear a presentation from a missionary, uh, Dr. uh, Mr. Uh, Crom. He was from the Boston Missionary Society. And He gathered them up. These are core leaders in uh, that part of the world among uh, the native population to share with them the gospel, to share with them this is what it means to be a Christian. And so they gathered them up. The preacher preached. And then uh, a chief uh, known as Red Jacket, he, uh, he responded to the sermon. So spokesman for the group. Now he's heard, they've heard the sermon. Now he's going to respond to the sermon. This is what, uh, what he said. Brother, you say there is but one way to worship and serve the great spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not all agree as you all read the same book? Of course, the difficulty there, he's identified most people aren't reading the book. But then he says, brother, we told you that we have been, you have been preaching uh, to the white people in this place. This is still the chief talking we're told that you've been preaching to the white people in this area these people are our neighbors Uh, we're acquainted with them so we will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has on them if we find them to be good if it makes them more honest less disposed to cheat indians then we will then consider again what you have said okay think about the the reach of that what if What if everyone was just waiting to see? So you claim to be a Christian. You say you follow Jesus Christ. So what difference is it making in you? How do you stand apart from the crowd? Does it change how you live? And let me tell you something. Everybody is watching. Would people accept your professed faith based upon the difference it makes in your daily life as they observe it? I think the Apostle Peter in uh, 1 Peter, a little book in the back of your New Testament, uh, he was hitting some of those same themes. And he said, people are watching every move you make to see if your faith is moving anything in you, to see if it's the real deal for you, and it affects how you live. People who are not believers are all around us always. And here's what Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. What a great phrase to describe what sin does. It wages war against our eternal soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. He's the way that Peter refers to folks far from God. So that when they slander you as evildoers, just saying, hey, you're, you're, uh, you're bad people. You're not all you're cracked up to be. They will actually observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits and he comes again. So they'll observe your good works. Observe here is a word that doesn't mean a passing glance, something casual. It means a careful observation, a a detailed analysis, an evaluation of, of life. People are watching our lives. If you claim to be a Christian, and that's true in your neighborhoods, true in your workplace, true wherever you are all the time, they're saying, is there anything that says this is something I'd want? Something I'd want to have any part of? Is it making a difference in you? If it's not making a difference in you, I'm not interested in it for my own life. And uh, what do they watch? Uh, here's some ways to say it. To say, does your behavior match your professed belief? Does your walk match 
all of your big religious talk? Does your character match your confession of faith? And does what you claim to believe on Sunday match what you're living out on Monday? Uh, the simple word for that kind of life is in integrity, right? Integrity is a key to Christian discipleship. Uh, Red Jacket, Chief Red Jacket, he wanted to see if uh, these professing Christians, if they were good, honest, not given to cheating. And so the question is always, what do people see in your character? When, as, when you, I don't want to mess you up today, but you know you drove on the lot, and people know you drove on the lot, your neighbors know you got in a car and you're going to church, and they're going to be watching you when you get home. What are they seeing, and does it match up in what they see in your character? Okay, so that's a big sweep. Now here's, now let's, let's drill down on this. The challenge of character is that it's a, it's a long obedience in the same direction. You can build character and you can be a person of great character and spiritual commitment and faithfulness for, for months or years or decades. And you can blow that whole thing up in, a, in one moment. Uh, and we'll give some examples of that. But you can make good choices for a long time, but here's what you'll be remembered for. You'll be remembered forever by one bad choice, one key failure, one wrecking sin. Or more likely, it's there's the public side of you that all's good, and then there's, there's that hidden away side of you. And there's, there's a pattern of sinfulness. Small unnoticed by most of the world but eventually if it goes unchecked eventually it's going to surface and there are going to be consequences and the consequences are going to mark what people think about your character for the rest of your life so it's not just for a season it's not just for a day it's not just cherry picking good character here good character here good character here and a little bit of dirt on my cheerios it's a bigger sweep than that think about this samson well, Samson's a hero to his people almost single-handedly, pretty much single-handedly. He throws off the oppressing Philistine uh, dominance over God's people, Israel. He's, a, he's an amazing guy. But see, he has, he has this sexual sin that just piles up and piles up. So he, he's doing all this great stuff over here. And he has this sexual sin piling up over here, and it wrecks his life. So you see how that works. David. David in the Bible called a man after God's own heart. That's, that's a high commendation for God's word. A man after God's own heart. But if I say, hey, what do you know about David in the Bible? Yes, our average person on the street, what are they going to say? David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba. And they're, what they're going to remember is not all the great psalms that he wrote and all the great things he did and the man after God's own heart stuff. They're going to remember when he just he just went into a nosedive and crashed and burned by having an affair with someone who was married to someone else. And then to, when she showed up pregnant to cover that up, he has her husband killed. That's what people remember about David. Peter. Now, Peter, you know, think about, oh, man, he had ups and downs. But, boy, that great sermon he preached at Pentecost and all those people came to Christ. And how incredible leader in the early church. And yet, what people remember about Peter he denied the Lord how many times? See, you're not even good at math, but you remembered three times he did that. Three times. Because that's what we remember. We were, people remember the big failures. The last year, think about this. The last year, 18 months, how many public figures, political figures, uh, celebrities, uh, religious leaders, have been found out. People who seem to have it all together, famous, wonderful, beloved, and now you don't think of them that way anymore because the construction of their character, blueprints, the construction of their character had some fault lines in it that dismantled their integrity. And... Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about that which so quickly can wreck, undermine, twist, and tangle our character and how other people see us. And we're calling it the sin factor. 
and uh, we had deacons meet on Saturdays for breakfast and uh, we had our meeting yesterday and uh, I told them that uh, we're going to be talking about sin today and just on the upfront, just so you're not surprised we're going to come out against it so brace yourselves here and oh David and, and again David's a guy who struggled with sin he understands the difficulties but how he describes it in Psalm 36 this is a place a lot of people have probably never delved into what the Bible says about sin from Psalm 36 this so shines a bright light on the darkness of how sin works so Psalm 36 Psalms right in the middle of your Bible uh, and uh, verse 1 here's what David writes and or, oh, and he says uh, I like this uh, it's all about sin and uh, my notation. Those notations have been in there for centuries. Uh, it says it's a psalm of David, the Lord's servant. It also says for the choir director, Jeff. So nothing personal, but uh, it does say that. Okay. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked person. Dread of God has no effect on him. Why don't you lean into that for just a second? Dread of God, fear of God has no effect on him. For with his flattering opinion of himself, man, David is pulling uh, no punches. He does not discover and hate his iniquity, his sin. The words of his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. Verse 4 is another, uh, another one we'll spend some time with in a moment. Even on his bed. He's laying in, laying in bed at night. He makes malicious plans. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not reject evil. Okay. One person noted in this chapter, Davis tells us the first four verses, the deceitfulness, the sinfulness of sin, and then the delightfulness of a relationship to God comes in the second half that I read earlier in the hour. Psalm 37, we find uh, the great verse, Take delight in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. This is in the next chapter. And that's a great, uh, great verse. Delight yourself in the Lord. But if, and the idea is if we'll keep our focus on the Lord. I told you first Sunday of this year that I had a, I have a little note. Hebrews 12. I keep it right below my computer, so I see it every day. I'm going to keep it there 2019. It's kind of my thing to meditate on this year every day and it is fix my eyes on Jesus if I can just keep that focus uh, maintained all those other things fall away temptation isn't an issue when your eyes are fixed on Jesus if I can fix my eyes on Jesus you can fix your eyes on Jesus same kind of idea here that we uh, we just keep our focus on the Lord we turn our when we do that, we turn our minds, our hearts away from sin and temptation to sin. So it's pretty simple. If you find your delight in the Lord instead of the world's other distractions, and some of those are things that are really bad, really dangerous, really destructive, but most of them, most of the things that are going to be sin that, that entangle our lives and lead us away from God are not the horrible headline-making things. They're just other than God's best for you. A lot of them are even good things, except they take the place of God in your life and become an idol of the heart. And it's no less sin than the thing that we say, oh, here's the really bad sense, because it is against God. Life works the way God, who designed us, made us, created us, intended for life to work. And living with and living out the character of God is where you're going to find your joy and your purpose and the beauty that God intends for life. Now, here's a simple way. We're going to look at these first four verses. Two things in your outline today uh, you want to write down. And my study, this is just a simple way to, to frame this. Two things. First thing, sin deceives the sinner by convincing him he does not have to fear God or hate sin. And man, that covers so much territory. Now, sin is always deceptive. It convinces you you do not have to fear God or hate sin. The heart of sin is a lack of understanding of who God is. I don't fear God. And that's what most people are going to tell you. 
At least they're going to live it that way. I'm not afraid of having to answer to God one day. Sinners that do not fear Him are in a dangerous spot. We're all sinners, but when you stop fearing God, you're in a dangerous path. Paul uh, had this uh, psalm in mind, I think, when he composed the opening chapter of the book of Romans. Because he, he developed such a detailed doctrine of sin in that, in that first chapter. Moving on through the third chapter. And he, he says, uh, and by the way, he quotes, uh, no fear of God. He quotes that first chapter of Romans. By the time we get to chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's what happens. The person he's describing, that first part of uh, those four verses, does not understand God's absolute holiness. Therefore, they believe God is not going to judge sins. We start, no matter, I find this over and over again. People say, sin's not that bad. My sin's not that bad. Your sin's terrible, not mine. And people, uh, people think of God as less than the Bible says, describes God. He is uh, a benevolent grandfather in the sky who just says, well, those kids sometimes... Uh, He's, uh, he's going to look the other way. He's not too worried about it. He's always going to forgive us, so why do we need to worry about, about rooting sin out of the details of our lives? All those things start coming into play, and he's tolerant, really, of most sins, except for the, you know, the, the really, really bad ones. And God is a God of love, and everybody loves that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he's also a God of justice, of judgment, of holiness. And you can't just pick one little piece of God to the neglect of the bigger picture of the person, the character of God. And how do we know that's true? Because, and here in, uh, here in Collin County, we know that somewhere less than 10% of the population of Collin County are going to be in any kind of Bible teaching church today. Less than 10% of the population of Collin County. So, less than 10. Here's what we also know. About 94% of Americans anywhere in our country will tell you they're going to heaven when they die. And that's how we know we do not fear God. And we do not believe one day we will answer to him. Here's the second thing. Sin flatters the sinner into thinking. He's really not a bad sinner. And uh, that's. Uh, for with his flattering opinion of himself. He does not discover and hate his iniquity. Satan will tell you you're pretty special. And he'll keep telling you that. Because he's a liar. Now you're special to God. Uh, but uh, you're not so special that your sin. Is something God overlooks. So what happens is we don't hate our own sin and we, uh, we become experts at justifying our sin, rationalizing our sin, convincing ourselves our sin is really not that bad. And in our culture, this is what we do, especially whatever I think, whatever I feel, whatever I do, however I identify as this is good in my behavior, that's what God's good with. And we just create our own little world that's separate from this book. And we, we say, my sin is okay because I'm me. And who knows better than me what is okay and not okay? That's a dark spot to be. We say, after all, we look around and we say, it's always interesting to me uh, We talk about sin. Well, but I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a mass murderer. Well, good. Thanks. But then we make excuses. Well, but the, but the lying, the lust, the greed, the gluttony, the gossip, those are more garden variety sins. And I think those are the ones that God's okay with. I think he just overlooks those because it's kind of like, uh-oh, that's like an uh-oh. And uh, God doesn't really worry about that sin. Harry Ironside's a pastor. He died in 1951. He started 
He was born uh, late late 1800s. And I have a couple of his books, but he has a story about he was at a gospel meeting, shared the gospel with a big crowd. This guy came up to him to talk to him after the meeting, and and Ironside asked him, and this would have in that in the, in American culture at that time it would have worked really well. He said, "Are you saved, sir?" And the man replied, "I, I am not, but but I want to be." So Ironside asked him what everyone needs to get to before you can be saved, before your sin can be taken away, before you can have a relationship to God, eternal life in heaven. You got to recognize you're a sinner and you're lost, separated from Him for time and eternity by your sin. And so he said, do you realize you're a lost sinner? And the man replied, well, I, I suppose I am. And then he added, but I'm not what you'd call a bad sinner. And then he said, I am, I think, a rather good one. I always try to do the best I know. So there's your, there, I'm, I'm a sinner, but I'm one of the good sinners. There was a, there was a pastor, this 17th century guy, uh, found this quote. He said, consider no sin against a great God to be a little sin. Second thing, after we, so we don't fear God, we flatter ourselves with how good we are. We overrate our, underrate our badness, overrate our goodness, even in the middle of our sin. The second thing is sin deceives the sinner so that he plans and pursues it. Man, that's the laying in your bed at night thinking, how am I going to sin next? Okay, so David shows how... In how wrapped up in deceit the sinner really is. The sin deceives him so that he can't see it. He can't see it well enough to hate his own sins. So that's verse 1 and 2. For a lot of sinners, <laughs> I don't like other people's sin. I can spend a little time with you. I can spot all your sins and I'll point them out to you if you'd like for me to. I just don't see my own sin. I can overlook what is my sin. What is my rebellion against God? What is my darkness? I can live with my sin and be okay, and surely God is okay with it, right? If I'm okay with it. But then, as he describes the person, that same person, he starts being his words, he's malicious, he's deceptive, and he stops acting wisely and doing good. The last part of verse 3, that when you become comfortable with the little sins, with the garden variety sins, it starts creating things in your character that you did not realize are developing. And before long, you have this stack of, of darkness that's, that's, that's developed in your heart that yeah, you find yourself just a long way from God on a day. Verse 3 says just that, that that person's in a downward spiral. Wisdom, uh, good behavior start to fall by the wayside. They don't even realize it because that's the deceptiveness of sin. You don't, really, you don't just wake up one day and say, I am going to be one crazy sucker starting today. I'm going to land over, way over here today. It begins slowly, deceptively. Rather than despising evil, here's what this guy does. Lies awake at night thinking about the next sin. Planning, plotting. How can I, what can I do next? How can I get away with this? He's not just drifting accidentally into sin anymore but he is desperately deliberately intentionally planning it prophet hosea in the old testament said for they their hearts are like an oven he's talking about god's sinful people who are embracing their sin and he says their anger smolders all night again they're letting things slow burn and in the morning it blazes like a flaming fire this is uh, the person who's, I'm thinking about how to get that person uh, to, to build a relationship with them, to maybe give me an opportunity to take it well beyond what it ever should be. Somebody I am not married to, that, that kind of idea. Or you're figuring out, how can I manipulate my world 
so that I can get that next, uh, next view of pornography or the next drink or skim some money at work. But you, you, you find yourself scheming it, big, trying to, when, is, when am I free? When is there an opening? When is there a vulnerable point? And David may be describing a whole lot of people. You do not despise evil. You're planning to do evil. And you can profess to be a Christian, but your secret thoughts start revealing as you're planning your sinfulness, your next sin, the next thing you're going to do wrong, the next thing you're going to do counter to God's perfect will for your life is revealed in His Word. You have no fear of God. There's a lot of darkness to be found in a life wrapped up in sin. And Satan really is, he, the Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies. He'll lie to you. Lie to you about the, he told Eve, God told you the consequences, you're going to die, you're not going to die. Satan is always going to be a liar. He's always going to paint sin as small, and God is even smaller. Uh, I have this in my prayer journal, and uh, truthfully, I do not know where I found it. I've had it for years. It's in uh, my confession of sin part of my journal, and I'm just going to read this. Satan's a liar, so... Here's the lie. Here's the truth. Okay, we're just going to run through these quickly. One lie. This is such a minor, insignificant sin, it's really not a big deal in God's eyes. Truth. Every sin is a horribly offensive to God. Sin is the sum of all evils, the opposite of all that's good, holy, and beautiful. Even the smallest of my sins required the death of the Son of God on the cross. There's no such thing as a minor sin. Every sin, the smallest of things as we like to measure sin, a cosmic treason against the holy God. Lie number two, I'll give in to sin this one time and then I'll be done with it. Man, have you ever been hit with that one? Okay, this is the last time. I'm not going to do this again. This is the last time I'm going to do this and then I'm going to be clear and get it out of my system. Every time I give in to sin, here's what happens. It weakens the Holy Spirit's influence in my life, even as a, as a believer. And it makes it easier to sin again. And every time you give, every time you stand up to temptation, the Holy Spirit's power is stronger in you, and it's easier to say no the next time. It, that runs both ways. But a lot of people, Satan will tell you, "Oh, just one more time, and then you can stop." Sin has a way of sinking these barbed hooks into us deep, and you can't just sin and walk away from it unscathed. And the more you give in to sin, the more entangled you become. And sin always leaves scars. Uh, next lie, this sin is just a part of who I am. I mean, I always struggle. This is just where it goes for me. I always will sin in this way. And uh, what I would say, if you belong to Jesus Christ, sin does not define your identity. Your identity is found in Christ. I am a new creation in Christ, and he sets us free from the enslaving power of sin. Sometimes when, Satan, when temptation comes, you need to quote some scripture to that temptation. You absolutely do not have to obey the sinful passions that you struggle with. I may have a struggle. Certain things are easy for me to fight against, and other things are hard for me, and yours will be a completely different thing. The things that are easy for you to say no to, and other things that are going to be really hard for you, where you wrestle with in sin, Last one I'll touch on. I need to give in to this sin in order to be happy. I mean, God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to have to do this. Sin never gives you happiness. It promises sweetness, and it delivers a payload of destruction, dissatisfaction, ruined relationships, and hardness of heart. We all are going to face temptations of all kinds. But God wants you to beat temptation. We do not have to sin. As powerful as the temptations feel, and that's true for a follower of Jesus Christ, the first thing you need to do to get on the track I'm about to run on is to say, I am a sinner, and I am lost. I'm not a little bit of a sinner. Cosmic treason against God, helplessness before God, and I need His, I need his forgiveness. I believe what Jesus did at the cross paid for my sin. And I want to surrender my whole life to him. I'm going to follow him with all my heart for the rest of my life. And you make that personal commitment to Christ. And then, the Bible is filled with helps for you to overcome whatever temptation Satan throws your way. 
So I'm going to give you eight quick things, and we're going to run through these quickly. Here's the first thing. Pray before you are tempted. How about that? Instead of waiting until you're caught in a bear trap, why don't you, why don't you pray? Maybe the beginning, it's great the beginning of the day. What did Jesus say in the model prayer? Lead us not into temptation. Just build a guardrail out there on the front end of your day. God, keep me from temptation today. Protect my heart. Deliver me from evil and from the evil one. I mean, that model prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Pray that every day. How about that? Every day, lead me not into temptation. Every day, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me this day. Here's the second thing about temptation. Flee. F-L-E-E. Flee. Temptation. Uh, a, a good run is better than a great fall. How about that? Run from temptation. What do you do with temptation? Well, let's see. The temptation is this line right there. That's, then I'm going to fall. So how close to the line can I get without falling off, right? I know that sin's here. How close can I get without actually crossing the line? Does it, if my toes are behind the line here, but my hand is over, is, that's probably still okay. And we start finding all these ways. How close can I get to sin? How much can I play with sin and still be all right? Instead, you need to be like Joseph when uh, Potiphar's wife's trying to seduce him. And she has every opportunity, and so does he to fall to the sin. What does he do? He just takes off running as fast as he can go in the other direction. Flee temptation. Run the other way. Uh, Proverbs 7 is a great study in uh, temptation. Because it's a story of a foolish young man. A young man, uh, I think my translation is lacking sense. And so he's out, and what is he? he wanders, the Bible says, near the house of the seductress, the woman, at twilight. Just, oh, I'm just, she, she lives there, and I'm going to just casually walk over that way. Uh, well, there she is. And guess what? She's dressed like a prostitute. And she's a pretty good line, uh, uh, sales line for me. That my husband's out of town. My bed is all perfumed. Why don't you come in? And he says, well, I don't know. He just steps into the danger zone. And what happens? It says, he goes into her and he is like an, uh, th this phrase is so telling. He's like an ox going to the slaughter. He has no, uh, he, like just a dumb animal and about to be devastated. You think about Eve. She gets into trouble. Here's Satan is tempting her. And instead of, and she says, well, God said. And she gets this back and forth with Satan. You don't need to get into back and forth. Just run the other way. It's the best way to deal with sin. Flee temptation. Third thing, quote scripture. That's how Jesus overcame temptation. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he began his public ministry. Remember, he quoted scripture, quoted scripture. So there's some things just reminds us. When you get gripey, I don't know if you've noticed, there are gripey people in America. They gripe about everything. When you're tempted to get into that game and just being grumbly and gripey and complaining and criticizing everybody else, maybe to, to quote back to yourself, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice because I didn't hear it the first time. That's why Paul says it twice, I think. Quote some scripture back to your heart. When you're tempted to give a harsh reply, remember, a gentle answer turns away wrath. When you're, when someone uh, kind of calls you out on something you're doing. You don't like to be called out. You don't want to be, point out that, man, it's a dangerous path. It, the path of wisdom is not here, it's here. Uh, just remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So maybe you need a little humility to be able to hear uh, God's truth in your life. Now, there are two things about that. First, if you're going to quote scripture, what do you have to have? You've got to have Scripture, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. How about that? So hide, your word in, hide God's word in your heart and you won't sin against God. The other thing, you're just going to be in God's word regularly. A regular feeding process, taking it in. You'll be in a good spot. Fourth thing, pray in the midst of temptation. 
Now, he said, pray, begin your day, lead us not into temptation, but when the temptation comes, and there it is, it's right in front of you. And don't say, well, let's see, man, what should I do? Just say, God, I know this is wrong, and I pray that you will give me the courage to run, first of all, to go the other direction. But then, beyond that, God, help me. Give me the strength to stand up to the temptation. We have a sympathetic high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus knows how strong temptation can be. You know who knows more about temptation than anybody else in the world? Jesus. You know how he knows more than anybody else in the world about temptation? Because he never gave in to it. He stood up to the full force of temptation to sin and yet without sin. So he understands how tough temptation can be. We don't know how tough can, temptation can be. We're gonna, we probably caved way before we, were, we got to the Jesus level, most certainly. So pray in the midst of temptation. Ask for God's help immediately. He is there and ready for you. Uh, fifth thing, get a brother or sister to pray with you. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, If someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Uh, get somebody to pray for you. I'm really struggling with this. I'm having a hard time. This is, this is one of those things. We've talked so much about the importance of community. A lot of people are trying to live out my relationship to God as a me and God thing. The Bible overwhelmingly says it's a we and God thing. And the way you overcome temptation, you go shoulder to shoulder with other believers as you go through life and you're going to find a different kind of strength. Sixth thing, ask someone to hold you accountable. Tell a friend where you need to grow, where sin is a struggle. Be verbal about it. Ask them to pray for you, knowing that they're going to ask you, so how's that going? Because that level of accountability is, is a real strong help in the fight against temptation. Seventh thing, remember God's faithfulness. So this is the, one of the great misapplied verses in the Bible. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. This is the, where people say, oh, God will never give you more than you can handle. The Bible doesn't say that at all. What it says is you'll never be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he'll provide a way out so that you'll be able to bear it. He's not going to paint you into a corner. He loves you too much for that. He's going to get you out of there. If you will trust him, look to him. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond the strength, the power of the Holy Spirit in you as a believer in Christ. He'll provide a way of escape to get you through it. Eighth thing, remind yourself sin has consequences. That's a pretty good deterrent. Remind yourself sin has consequences. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Whatever you're planning, that's what you can expect to grow. And we're pl- if you're planning a lot of sin, there are going to be a lot of s- consequences of sin that are going to come around to bite you in the worst of ways. Okay, so back to David and Bathsheba. So David, he has this affair with this woman he is not married to. She is married to somebody else. And then to cover up his sin, he has her, has, uh, her husband killed. Did God forgive David? Absolutely, the Bible says he did. He repented of his sin, confronted by the prophet Nathan. He repents of his sin. I am so sorry. God, please forgive me. And God forgave him, but told him, the sword will never depart from your house. You will deal with conflict for the rest of your life. And his own family would do him great harm. And the child that was conceived in that uh, relationship between him and Bathsheba would, would die. He was forgiven of his sin, but you can be forgiven of your sin, but there's still going to be consequences that may circle around because of sin. You, you, you're still going to come back to hit you. And I tell you that up front to say, when you go down that path, God will forgive you, but a lot of people say, well, it's okay, God will forgive me. It's okay, God's a God of grace, and he'll just let me off the hook, let me off the hook, let me off the hook. Listen, he is a God of grace. But there are all kinds of of shrapnel that you're going to be carrying in your body uh, when you start stepping on a landmine. Listen, on any given day, any given moment, every one of us is determining our character. Or we are just living out our character. And today, uh, this is my challenge for you. You're either living more in the 
Psalm 36, 1 through 4 into things, or you're living in the verse 5 through verse 12 into things. And you feel it, you, you sense it, or you feel a bite of verses 1 through 4 in some key area of your life. And here's what I'd ask you. So, there's Psalm 36. Where do you want to be? What's keeping you from being there? What are you going to do about it? And here's the thing. I'm assuming I have stirred this pot enough today that something's come to mind for just about everybody. It's an attitude, it's an action, it's a relationship, something uh, God stirs, the Holy Spirit awakened in you, not something I named, but we talk about sin, the Holy Spirit starts talking. And what are you going to do about that? And everybody here has already made a decision, probably. Well, I think I can still manage my sin. I think I can get away with it. I think I can keep flying under the radar. I think, I, I, I think I'm going to be okay with my sin. Because it's, a, in my estimation, a little sin, not one of the big bad ones. Or you said, God, I'm going to call it what it is. I'm not going to call it a bad habit. I'm not going to call it a character flaw a place of weakness for me. I'm just going to call it what you call it. I'm going to call it sin against the holy God. And when you, when you put it in the light, when sin in the light, there's every opportunity for sin to be defeated in your life. You're living in fear. You're dominated by your anxieties. What is it that, that you say, I'm putting it in the light and I'm going to call it what God calls it and I'm going to ask him to give me victory in this area of my life. He loves you and he wants to help you. Lean into 